All right, so it's a real thrill to be here. Um, thanks, Nima, for inviting me. Uh, so, and this is uh, work uh, with Rothstein, uh, mostly based on a paper that we put out um, about a month ago. And uh, to uh, motivate the talk, I'll start by reminding you of uh, the fact that um, quantum gravity um, perhaps is uh, well understood at low energies, at energies much less than the Planck scale. Uh, and it's, uh, it can be described as a low energy effective theory of interacting gravitons, self-interacting gravitons plus interactions with matter. And this is a theory that uh, makes definite uh, predictions. Uh, the first one, perhaps, is due to DeWitt already over 50 years ago of the 2 to 2 graviton scattering amplitude. It's a definite expression that uh, scales like energy squared over M Planck squared. Actually, a much simpler expression that he thought he, he should get. He, he noticed that in his paper. Uh, and he said there must be a reason why the answer is so simple. I think people now understand that. Uh, but back then, they did not. Uh, the theory can also, it's an effective theory, it can also be used to calculate loop corrections. Uh, for he say In his paper, if you don't mind, yeah. he gives a formula for how much you scatter in the process. Yeah, yeah. So it's not loaded upon him how much you scatter in the process. Is that right? And I've always wondered if the reason why he didn't have some sort of formula that he just liked the answer to, whether it was quite complicated, but it sounds like he caught that formula somewhere. By the way, so did Park and Taylor. <laughs> They're not doing it. Yeah. Yeah. But but he had polarized cross sections, correct? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so, uh, so yeah, DeWitt did uh, this calculation uh, over 50 years ago. Uh, but also, the theory can be used to compute loop corrections. For instance, here is the one loop correction to the Newtonian potential between two test masses. Uh, of course, none of these things are, uh, in practice, observable in the near future. but. The same effective theory also makes more interesting predictions in the context of cosmology, as people here also are aware of. Um, and um, while it's true that I think that things are well understood at the level of scattering amplitudes involving elementary particles, maybe it's fair to say that uh, when the so-called asymptotic states are black holes, um, this theory is not yet complete. It, it, it can't compute. Well, it's not the first time this happens to me. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. <laughs> so, so much for artificial intelligence. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, so maybe for elementary particles, for scattering amplitudes involving elementary particles, this theory is uh, well understood. But uh, there are processes involving quantum mechanical black holes uh, for which there are, maybe there's a gap in the literature. And the types of things, well, specifically what I'm interested in is the effects of Hawking radiation. And more specifically, how does Hawking radiation affect scattering processes? For instance, you might have an electron scattering off of a black hole through the exchange of a virtual, a, a neutral black hole through the exchange of a, of a virtual Hawking quantum photon. Uh, and so the question is, how does one compute things like that? Uh, or similarly, how does one compute corrections to soft photon emission theorems uh, due to, um, due to um, Hawking radiation? So uh, the goal of this talk is to set up a theory that can maybe compute some of these quantities. Um, this is going to be an effective field theory. And this effective field theory 
uh, the, so the methods that I know are um, applicable only in a certain uh, regime of scale. So I'm going to assume that I'm looking at length scales, I guess denoted here by delta. I'm not sure the symbol appears anywhere else. But I'm going to be looking at time scales that are sufficiently large compared to the short child radius of the black hole, such that the black hole is approximately a point object, uh, much smaller than the page time, the evaporation time of the black hole, because we don't yet know how to account for the back reaction if the black hole is evaporating. Uh, and uh, the black hole will treat semi-classically, uh, so the mass of the black hole will be much larger than the Planck scale. So that's what I'm going to assume for the, for the scales that I'm interested in. So, so none of this uh, has any bearing on the information puzzle because it's all at early times compared to the evaporation scale. Uh, and so uh, in this uh, range of scales um, where the wavelengths are large compared to the Schwarzschild radius, we're going to shrink the black hole down to a point and treat it as a world line. And so uh, we'll write down an effective Lagrangian for this black hole, including uh, as well finite size effects. And if you didn't know anything, that whether it was a black hole or a neutron star, uh, the only thing you would have are the symmetries of the problem and the, and the relevant degrees of freedom. So uh, when you write down uh, a, uh, an effective world line Lagrangian, you would write it using uh, the world line, the coordinate of the black hole, the center of mass coordinate, if you want to call it that. Um, spin will not play a role in this talk, but it's also there in principle. The way that that's described is in terms of a frame that's carried along the world line that describes how the black hole rotates relative to the external universe. And then the symmetries are uh, diffeomorphism invariance and world line reparametrizations. And then the rules are you just write down terms allowed by symmetries, uh, organized in a derivative expansion as usual. So at leading order in this expansion, uh, the only term you can write down, at leading order in derivatives, no derivatives on the metric, uh, the only term you can write down is the proper time term that leads to uh, geodesic motion. Uh, at the next order in derivatives, there are terms that are linear in the Ricci curvature, but those we can remove as long as we're dealing with black holes in otherwise empty space. We can remove those by field redefinitions of the metric. And so they won't affect anything physical. They won't show up. So you may as well just set them to zero. And then uh, the sort of the next, the, the actual finite size effects come in at curvature squared. And in four space-time dimensions, it turns out there's only two possibilities. And uh, people like to organize them in terms of the so-called electric and magnetic components of the Riemann tensor. There are certain projections onto the world line of the, of the Riemann tensor. And they're organized by parity. And I'm assuming parity, that whatever this object is, there's parity invariance. Otherwise, it could also be an E dot B. So there's only three terms in four dimensions. In generic dimension, I forgot how many, but it's you know, five or six terms, something like that. So that's, uh, that's the, at least a, a leading order in derivatives. That's what the effective theory of the, of the black hole looks like. And then uh, these uh, curvature terms, what they do is that they tell you about tidal response of the black hole. And so just to get a simple idea for what they should scale like, uh, we can start out with some sort of uh, weakly gravitating object, some sort of fluid, a planet of some sort. Uh, first, uh, unperturbed, but it's self-gravitating. So we assume that it's some sort of spherically symmetric object. It's not in an external gravitational field. It has zero quadrupole moments. It's spherically symmetric. And then you turn on an external gravitational field. You put a moon around this object. And so uh, now this object is going to get tidally deformed. And so there is an induced quadrupole moment. One can calculate um, sort of like you would do for the analogous E&M problem where you switch on an external field and the thing polarizes. 
And uh, the uh, induced quadrupole moment is proportional to uh, the tidal force, the, the tidal potential to gradients of the gra external gravitational field. And then uh, the units to go from quadrupole moment to derivatives of the potential, you need uh, five powers of length and one power of G Newton. So uh, conventionally, uh, one puts in the radius of the object to make up the units. And then there's some dimensionless coefficient here called the love number, uh, which is a term from elasticity theory or maybe from geophysics. It was introduced in the early 20th century to describe exactly this sort of situation, uh, tidal deformations in the solar system. So presumably, so this object would depend on the equation of state of this fluid and so on, and presumably it's order one in those units. That's what it is for a non-relativistic object. Um, how does that compare to the coefficients in my world line Lagrangian? Well, in terms of my parametrization, E squared and B squared, the induced moments are uh, the coefficient of E squared. The induced quadrupole moment is the coefficient of E squared. So we would expect this thing to scale like the radius to the five as well, at least for a sort of Newtonian object. Uh, however, the same scaling, that's what you would expect for uh, like a planet or something, but the same sort of scaling actually applies for relativistic compact objects uh, for, such as a black hole. And there is just dimensional analysis. If you look at the scattering of a graviton of a black hole, uh, the calculation of that scattering amplitude in GR um, is, uh, it only depends, the only scale is the short shell radius. So by dimensional analysis, the amplitude is some function of this dimensionless quantity. Omega is the frequency of the incoming graviton. And it scales like the radius. Here is the same thing computed in the effective theory, so just scattering off a graviton off of a fixed world line. Uh, the operator that we're looking at has is curvature squared, so it's four derivatives. So the amplitude goes like omega to the fourth. And then if you compare the two for the effective theory to match onto the full theory, uh, if there's an omega to the fourth piece here, it, it should go like radius of the five. So the same sort of uh, dependence on the radius is what you would expect for a relativistic object. Um, this love number was computed, well actually let me back off for a second. So it's a radius of the five effect and so if you were to put the black hole in a binary and ask at what order in a, let's say it's a non-relativistic binary of two black holes, at what order in the expansion does this effect come in? It's an effect that scales like, well, like the size of the object to the five. The only other scale is the orbital scale. And so if you use the fact that G Newton M over R goes like velocity squared for a, for a nearly circular orbit, uh, it's easy to see that uh, these sort of tidal effects are actually quite small in a, in a velocity expansion, the thing that will be relevant for LIGO. It's a, it's a so-called five post-Newtonian effect, meaning that it goes like five powers of velocity squared relative to uh, the leading order Newtonian potential. Uh, so for a black hole, this size r is exactly the, the Schwarzschild radius, so it really is a velocity to the 10 effect. But it's actually a bit enhanced for neutron stars, which are not as compact as black holes. So it's a, maybe it's a factor of 10 larger than, this, than the Schwarzschild radius, the size of the black hole. And so there's actually an enhancement here by, by a sufficiently large factor, uh, as first pointed out about 13 years ago by these people at Cornell. And because it actually is enhanced, there are already crude bounds on what this thing looks like uh, for neutron stars, what these coefficients look like for neutron stars. It's not a, a great bound because uh, you would need, I don't know, thousands of orbits to be able to be sensitive to this term in the waveforms and so on. But it's a, it's a start. Um, and so uh, it depends for a neutron star. The coefficient depends on the equation of state. And if you make assumptions about what that should look like, you can compute it numerically, as these same people did. 
And for a black hole, this uh, coefficient was not computed till uh, a bit later, maybe 10 years ago, uh, by a number of people approaching the calculation for, from different sides or using different approaches. Uh, but I think everybody agrees, using all these different methods, that, the, uh, that these love numbers are actually zero. So the, the finite size coefficient, this tidal uh, coefficient, is zero for a, for a four-dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. Only in four dimensions? Yes, only in four dimensions. In higher dimensions, it's not quite clear. So, uh, sorry, in higher dimensions, these, these people claim that it's non-zero. I'm not sure how much I believe their calculation because, as I said, there's a lot more operators. So I'm not sure. So they said, oh, the love number is zero, but I'm not quite sure what they mean by that because there's, it's not just e squared and b squared. But anyway, it, it seems to be non-zero away from the equals four. And as far as I know, there isn't a, a, a simple reason why these things vanish. It just, no, nobody, you know, you can throw, you can say, oh, it's the no-hair theorem, things like that. But I don't, I don't know. I don't know why that, why they vanish. It's, uh, this is, so it's a slow spinning Kerr, so it's the same, so the, the difference between Kerr and Schwarzschild at this level, it's, a, it's another curvature coupling, which is non-zero for Kerr. Uh, what I mean by that is that, there's a piece of chalk. So the, the Kerr black hole would also have this E squared operator, but the difference between Kerr and Schwarzschild at the level of this world line is that Kerr has a finite size coefficient of this form that couples the spin of the Kerr black hole to the curvature with some known coefficient here that's non-zero. That's not a tidal effect. That's just the fact that the Kerr black hole has a quadruple moment. I don't know if that answers. But those coefficients are the same, at least in a slow spin expansion, which is where these theories are written down. So uh, at the level of the quadrupole moments, it seems like there's no static um, tidal response. The higher Ls have not been computed. I'm not sure why. I think it should be easy to, to do it. But I, I, I think people believe that those should also vanish. Um, and so um, if these coefficients vanish, does it mean that there are no finite size effects due to black holes in a binary? Uh, the answer is no, because so far we're neglecting uh, dissipation. For instance, the absorption of energy by the horizon. Uh, for instance, one object moves around the other, emits gravitational waves. Partially they get scattered out to infinity. Partially they get absorbed by the second black hole. Uh, so uh, at some level there should be dissipation, but it's not captured by any of these terms, because if you could compute with this, is purely conservative. Um, I will also uh, soon also include emission, Hawking emission from the black hole, and that's obviously not included in any of these terms. And so uh, certainly for absorption, uh, um, why does this theory not include it? It's because if, if there's absorption, there, there have to be modes that are doing the absorbing, low frequency modes, uh, and they are not, um, captured by this sort of theory where you're integrating out stuff at s scales of order, the, sh the short child radius. Uh, for a neutron star, for instance, these would be hydrodynamic modes. There's viscosity in this, in this finite baryon density fluid, et cetera. Uh, for a black hole, maybe it's a little more mysterious what these degrees of freedom should be at the classical level. Uh, the black hole has a number of zero modes. Uh, the world line degree of freedom, the spin, the mass is also a sort of zero frequency perturbation of the black hole. So you can move the mass around. You can change the mass, change the mass in the solution without any sort of change in the frequency. Uh, and there are also the quasi normal modes of the black hole that um, are certainly uh, heavy compared to the short shot radius. Uh, but Maybe they're not things that you can integrate out in the usual Wilsonian sense because they're not like the narrow resonances that we're used to in particle physics. They're kind of weird because uh, if you look at, so there are quasi-normal modes for every value, for every partial wave. Here are the ones for the graviton. 
Uh, and if you look at them, the real part of the, of the frequency of the, of the mode, uh, as you go up in, I don't know, excitation number, radial quantum number, the real part gets smaller and sm smaller, and they get more and more damped. And at some point, you go to a level where the real part, it, so for every L, there's a so-called spe algebraically special quasi-normal mode that has zero real part, so zero mass, but finite width. And so if you integrate out something like that, you might get a non-local term in the Lagrangian, something like that. So, so there are degrees of freedom that somehow are not being included in uh, the world line theory that I described. And the question is, how do you put those in without necessarily knowing what sort of degrees of freedom you're dealing with? Uh, how do you put this into the formalism while being agnostic about what these modes are? And so the way that uh, Ira and I uh, decided to do this uh, for the classical problem a while ago now was to just think of the black hole or the neutron star, for that matter, as if it were some sort of atom. Uh, so if you had an atom in an external field uh, at long wavelengths, the leading term would be some sort of dipole coupling to the external electric field, and then all the the response of this atom to the external field is encoded in the uh, correlation functions of this uh, dipole moment, which you can calculate in quantum mechanics. It's just the operator x for the electron in the atom or something like that. And so if you just know the Green's functions of the, of the, uh, of, of the x operator in the state of the atom, then you can compute the response. And so for gravity, we're going to do something analogous where we just couple the, some dynamical moments that we're going to treat as operators. Eventually, we'll be doing quantum mechanics, although so far the story is classical. Uh, and so we have some operators that couple to the external curvature, which are, and so we parameterize it in the same way. So there's some electric uh, curvature coupled to an electric quadrupole moment in a magnetic uh, term as well. And then if we know the uh, correlators of these objects, then we can make predictions, for instance, for the black hole in a binary or scattering of uh, gravitons off of the black hole, for instance. And so uh, just to give you an example of how this works and also as a sanity check that it reproduces known things in GR, uh, I want to first look at um, graviton absorption by the black hole and then see how that, how, how once I uh, extract the correlators uh, from the uh, absorption cross section, how I can use them to compute observables like uh, corrections to the so radiation reaction type effects. So, uh, so what we do is uh, we, we have this sort of Q dot E world line interaction and then we look at uh, so the object, the black hole, starts in some state corresponding to mass m, much larger than the Planck scale. And then we look at a process where the black hole absorbs a graviton and goes into some state that you don't observe. Uh, here is the amplitude to leading order in the interaction. It factorizes into a calculable piece, which is just a graviton matrix element, which you can compute using the methods that DeWitt invented a long time ago. And then a, uh, a, a matrix element involving this operator that we don't really know anything about. But uh, we can even, that doesn't stop us, we can square this amplitude, sum over the final states, uh, normalize the states properly to get a cross section, an absorption cross section that depends uh, after you sum over the final states and assume unitarity, that is an assumption in what I'm doing, that depends on the Whiteman two-point functions of these uh, mysterious operators that I wrote down. So here's the absorption cross-section in terms of those correlators, and it also depends on the polarizations of the, uh, of the, of the gravitons. So uh, here is the absorption cross-section and the effective theory. In the full theory, so far, we're just looking at classical stuff. So the full theory involves a calculation of a transmission coefficient after you separate variables. Uh, so we're looking at graviton modes that are being 
uh, graviton states that are being thrown into the black hole. And so you decompose it into partial waves, and then the radial part turns into a, sort of a quantum mechanics problem, meaning a radial problem, involving a, a potential of this form. Um, the frequency of the modes is small compared to the height of the, so there's a barrier, and so the modes tunnel, and then the cross-section in the full theory is just this reflection coefficient squared, basically which was computed uh, a long time ago by Page, um, and I think even before that by Starobinsky by a couple of years, not just for a short child black hole, but uh, also for the curved black hole uh, for various spins. He, I, actually, he did it for arbitrary spin, but I'm only showing you up to spin two. So spin two fields or lower coupled to the black hole. Uh, it's always at low frequency suppressed by powers of the radius times the frequency that just reflects the angular momentum barrier in this potential that I wrote down. Uh, and uh, we can just take the graviton answer, set the rotation of the black hole to zero, which I'm neglecting in this talk. And then, uh, at least naively, uh, compare that to the compare the, that to the result in the uh, effective theory to extract the two-point function at positive frequency because I'm looking just at absorption. And then if I assume there's no emission from the black hole, uh, you just set the negative, so that's related to the negative frequency part of this Green's function. We just set that to zero. Turns out we learned later that when we do that, w what we're doing is matching in the Boulware state. I'll come back to that point in a second. But that's the two-point function uh, of this quadrupole operator for the black hole. It's the same for the electric and the magnetic pieces. And once you have that, you can insert it into the two-body problem uh, to make predictions for, for um, binary dynamics. And so this part is a, is a bit sketchy because I don't have time to explain it in full. But basically, you compute an effective action uh, for the world lines of the two black holes that are in orbit next to each other. And that's some order in perturbation theory that involves a box diagram where uh, one of the black holes has uh, off-shell gravitons being mediated by this operator Q that I wrote down, and the other black hole at leading order is just the Newtonian potential. Uh, and if you compute this effective action that depends on the world lines of the black hole, if you vary it, it gives you the equations of motion. Uh, it's um, a so-called schwinger keldish or NN calculation. Uh, you find that the answer actually is related to a very specific combination of the two-point functions that appear here, namely the commutator. In fact, the retarded Green's function, the thing that in linear response would give you the induced quadrupole moment in response to a weak external gravitational field. So that's the thing that appears in the response, this, this uh, this object, um, it can be thought of in some sense as a dynamical love number. So in frequency space, it's just the frequency times the, uh, times the Fourier transform of this time-dependent gravitational field that you're putting the black hole in. And uh, there's a dispersion relation that relates that quantity to the correlators that we computed above. Um, the imaginary part of this thing is exactly related to the absorption cross-section. So we know what that is. It's given by, it's calculable. It goes like radius to the six. It's imaginary. It's a, it's a dissipative effect. Uh, the fact that there is a real part, that actually the real part is zero, that the classical love number is known to be zero. In the effective theory, we just have to tune that away. So it's some sort of to mysterious tuning from the point of view of low energy physics that might not be there in the full theory. So maybe that sounds like something we've heard of before. Uh, and so, what, and so this, this is all classical, that's right. And there's no, uh, if I remember correctly, this, there's no. All the h bars go to converting momentum. Yeah, that's right. And also there's no. Um, <laughs> classical radiative corrections to the love numbers. So it's not a tuning like the Higgs mass. That's right. Uh, anyway, um, 
once you have that effective action, it depends on the correlators. And if you vary it, it gives you the corrections to uh, the two-body dynamics and then the non-relativistic limit. Uh, it gives, you, gives rise to sort of a, a damping term in the gravitational force between the black holes. It's due to the fact that energy is being dumped into, the, into heating the horizons classically. Uh, and so there is energy loss in the binary into the degrees of freedom of the black hole, into exciting the quasi-normal modes. And so here is what that dissipated force looks like. It's a velocity dependent force, it's time reversal odd. And then once you have that quantity, you can comp compute the rate of change of energy, or, or the, yeah, the rate of change of energy dissipation. Uh, that's what it looks like. It's uh, a really high order effect in powers of G Newton. You can also compute the rate of change of, uh, or the rate of dissipation of angular momentum because uh, part of this energy goes into spinning the black holes, torquing them. And uh, this was done for black holes of comparable mass, but a sanity check is that we can take the limit where one of the black holes is very light compared to the other one. In that case, the calculation was done using conventional GR methods uh, so-called black hole perturbation theory, where you can just uh, look at the perturbations of a point mass around the black hole and compute how that point mass dissipates energy as it, as it uh, excites the horizon. And so that's the leading order term here, and it agrees with the known results. So it's a, so it's a check that the methods that we introduced are not completely out there, hopefully. Uh, it is a small effect, so if you measure this relative to the quadrupole uh, radiation out to infinity in gravitational waves, it's down relative to that by uh, eight powers of the velocity. Um, nevertheless, I think people still include this in the templates, even if it's very small and it has not been tested yet by experiment. More interestingly, uh, as I said, I'm not discussing spin, but spin tends to enhance these sort of finite size effects. Uh, and actually, it trades three powers of velocity uh, but it for rather a velocity to the five effect, and it's tied in some ways to the Penrose process, to super radiance. Yes? Some, uh, when you say it's included in the template, yeah. someone does in their template to the calculator, someone does it in their simulation. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Th yeah, that's, so, so in the numerical simulations, these are all, there's no separation, these are all order one effects. What, what I'm referring to, yeah, so in the early part, there are models for, so there's, of course, a theoretical calculation, but there are people who, that's, that's, that, I understand. yeah. The early part is modeled using post-Newtonian. Post it's, it's a grab bag. It's post-Newtonian. It's partly uh, extrapolating to the numerical GR results. It's, it's a model. It's a very useful model. And, I, and from what I understand, people have thrown this into that. But it's not systematic in any way, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, that's uh, one uh, simple application of this formalism. Uh, the other thing we were able to compute is corrections to black hole, cla still classical, black hole, black hole scattering. Um, so we have now two black holes that could be relativistic, but it's large impact parameter, so that gravity is still perturbative. Uh, and so classically, what one computes is the momentum transfer between the black holes. You get that for point particles just by integrating the geodesic equation. Here's the classic result derived by Einstein, I guess. Uh, but uh, at some order, these dissipative effects also come in, and they depend on the retarded Green's function of the operator that I wrote down, the same exact quantity. And so you can now include that in the equations of motion and therefore compute the momentum transfer as well. Now it's not purely transverse. It's also along the velocities of the objects because it is a dissipative thing. Uh, and so it looks something like that, as I said, for relativistic objects. And then a check is that you can use this to compute how much mass each black hole gains or loses due to, the, to, due to this sort of tidal heating. Uh, and according to classical GR, it better be gain. 
And so it turns out that it indeed is purely a gain. If you plot this polynomial over, over the minus yeah, right. That's I was nervous, and then uh, and then, uh, but if you plot it, it's positive definitely. Uh, so anyway, so that's two simple applications. And now uh, for the rest of the talk, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, here you're, you're including everything by some two-point function on the order line. Inside. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't you have thought that you should just include the excited states? But you, you, you said it quickly, but why not, why yeah. not just include these? Ex I mean, the, the most sort of obvious thing might be to just include these excited states. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, it, that seemed to be messier because the, the spectrum is known only numerically, and somehow here we're sum, you know, we're getting an analytical answer, so we're summing over all those modes, even though in some sense they decouple. Uh, but, the thing, but the the interesting part of your, I mean, okay. Yeah, it's you know, I somehow I think w so. This is something that I have been meaning to do, what I haven't done. I think it's actually all going to be dominated by this sort of magic mode that I mentioned, which is yeah, the. Yeah, all I know about it is that there's an exactly, it's called algebraically special. I'm not quite sure why, but it's a solution. It's a, it's a quasi-normal mode, right? So it's purely, uh, what is it? Purely outgoing at infinity, purely outgoing at the horizon. Those are the boundary conditions. And then when you put all those boundary conditions, you only get solutions for some fixed set of frequencies. Turns out that for every partial wave, there is one guy that has a uh, frequency that with zero real part and uh, some non-zero imaginary part. And now I don't recall if the imaginary part is known analytically. Are the so real parts greater than or equal to zero? Or so the real parts are, uh, the real part, I, I think you actually get both signs for the real part. The imaginary part is only damp. Somebody proved that rigorously a long time ago. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so uh, I suspect somehow that's the mode that gives you r gives rise to all this stuff. Why would that mode be important? Because uh, because it has zero frequency in a way, right? It's only it's pure damping. So somehow I think it's reproducing that. But that's just a speculation. I don't I don't know. It's a calculation I I've been meaning to do. It's. Uh, it's uh, you know if you it's uh, all the other modes have um, th have um, finite real part frequency so in a sense that they should decouple maybe this one does not I don't know it's a, it's a speculative statement you can take it or leave it but I'm just saying the, the obvious thing you throw something yeah. in the black hole yeah. it rings back down right right, case, right. you would think you could include that excited state in the, yeah. in the vertex or something yeah. down to the ground yeah exactly that's the way I would like to think about it but we've never really been able to make contact with that picture um so yeah, so that's a good question. I don't, I don't have a good answer. So now I want to put in Hawking emission for no particular phenomenological reason. It was something that um, 10 years ago uh, somebody suggested that we do, and we, and we, we kept it out of our, uh, we kept it in the back of our minds for a while, and then last year we decided now is the time. And so uh, naively, uh, how would you do this? Well, you would do it the same way. If we can compute a absorption amplitude, we can also compute a graviton emission amplitude. Therefore, an emission rate by summing over the final states of the emitted graviton. It gives rise to a uh, differential decay rate that now depends on the negative frequency part of the same function. And uh, what do we compare to? Uh, First, let me do it naively, and then I'll, um, and then I'll do it correctly, uh, just to get an idea how it should scale, and, and then I'll do it correctly. But naively, I would say, OK, well, what is this? This is just going to be identified with Hawking's result for the emission of a black hole, which uh, is a near black body filtered through the gray body factor, the, the absorption cross-section, and the Hawking temperature uh, one way of writing it down is that it's actually equal to h bar over 4 pi times the radius. So uh, we're interested in the limit of low frequencies. That's when this world line theory makes sense. And uh, I think if you look at reviews on black hole radiance, this is a well-known fact. But to us, it was a little bit surprising that the h bars actually cancel when you, from this formula altogether when you look at the things like the emission rate. 
Furthermore, when you take the low frequency limit, it's actually enhanced relative to absorption because of this uh, Planck distribution. Mr. Conrad, yes. Wave part cancels to count the number of photons emitted per second. Correct. If you want the energy emitted per second. It, then, then, there's, then you have M Planck's. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the H bars go away in the rate. Uh, uh, but uh, then if you identify the rate with this two-point function at negative frequency, it's actually enhanced over the classical dissipation, which actually went like radius to the six rather than five. Furthermore, it scales just like the classical lump number will be expected to with no one over M Planck suppression. And then this is the point where Ira and I got very uh, confused and very excited at the same time because we thought, you would see something at LIGO, but uh, of course, uh, that's too good to be true. And so let me, for the remainder of the talk, let me tell you how we figured out that that's too good to be true. I don't have a lot of time. I've been going slowly. We'll see how much I can do. So what I want to do now is match the effective theory uh, in the presence of Hawking radiation. And uh, there are two observables that were available to us in the literature that we were able to compare to. One of them was a two-point function, um, which we found in a paper by Candelis, but it actually seems to have appeared earlier, although we, as we were discussing earlier, we don't know where. Um, and the other result that we were able to use is uh, a little-known formula uh, conjectured by Bekenstein in a collaborator for the probability that the black hole emits n particles given that there are m particles in the initial state. Uh, it's kind of a remarkable formula. I'll show it to you in a second. Um, so it was conjectured on the basis of thermodynamics by Bekenstein and his collaborator, but Wald then just using quantum field theory in curved spacetime was able to reproduce it. And I think generalize it as well, if, 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 if I remember correctly. So these are the things that are available to us. And what we're going to do is we're just going to match onto them. And I'll come back to the effective theory of gravitons coupled to the black hole at the very end. But just to make things as simple as possible for ourselves, uh, I'm going to now treat the, well, the black hole is still a point object. But instead of a graviton, I'm going to have a, a, a massless scalar that's scattering off of it. And so in this point particle limit, it couples, again, to some operator that lives on the world line uh, times uh, the scalar. So um, let me first discuss the two-point function. Uh, it, at the time it was computed, uh, there were three re what b believed to be three reasonable choices for what should be the state of the field around the black hole. Uh, one of them is the so-called Bulwer state, where uh, there's actually no Hawking emission. So that will be the closest to what you would expect classically. It's a state that's annihilated by modes that are positive frequency relative to Schwarzschild time. Uh, the other interesting case is the uh, Unruh state, which um, is supposed to be supposed to mimic what happens in realistic gravitational collapse. And it corresponds to assuming that as Unruh showed in the same paper that discusses the Unruh effect for accelerated observers. Uh, it corresponds to saying that the vacuum or the state is empty of stuff coming in from past uh, infinity, asymptotic infinity, or past horizon. So you assume that it's an eternal black hole, but the boundary conditions mimic what would happen in realistic collapse. And uh, the final state that he looked at, which we will not really uh, touch upon here, is the hartle hawking state, which is when the black hole is immersed in a thermal bath at the Hawking temperature. And it's the equilibrium. Uh, the scalar is therefore in thermal equilibrium. So the two-point function is periodic in Euclidean time. Uh, the, these are the results that uh, Candelis' quotes for the, for the Whiteman function. So these are not time ordered. And they're in a fixed initial state. Uh, and so they're all written in terms of the same basic radial mode functions. Uh, but there are different boundary conditions corresponding to the three different states. 
And uh, that's what they look like. And they depend, uh, the modes are not known analytically for the 4D Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, but they depend on the uh, gray body factor, which at low frequency is known analytically, as Paige showed. Uh, what we're going to do here is simplify this by taking the limit where the two uh, points in the, in the correlator are at the same spatial coordinate, different times. And then we're going to look at the radius goes to infinity limit of this quantity. Uh, so what we're really looking at is the response of a, of a detector, a so-called Unruh box that's placed very far away from the black hole. And it's just sitting there coupled to the field. And it depends on what the black hole is doing in some sense. And so uh, that response function, well, that's this function here. But uh, then the, the two-point function in the full theory, in the background of the black hole, uh, starts out as some sort of flat space uh, thing. So either the, the vacuum two-point function in flat space in the Bulwer or Unruh case, or in the Hartle-Hawking case, uh, the thermal two-point function in flat space. And then the 1 over R squared term is the effects of curvature. And then the different functions have a different form depending on which state you're in. In the Bulwer state, uh, there's only positive frequency response. That means that there's only absorption, but no emission. There's no Hawking radiation. And then in the Unruh state and in the Hartle-Hawking state, you, one actually finds that the response functions turn out to, are, to be the same. And in both cases, obey uh, the KMS condition necessary for uh, thermal equilibrium. So the Fourier space version of uh, periodicity in Euclidean that's the, uh, that's the uh, uh, full theory. Uh, we also compute, so to match, we compute the same quantity in the effective theory. And so that can be represented in terms of Feynman diagrams, where a leading order is just uh, the free uh, massless propagator in flat space. And then the interactions encode the presence of the black hole. So there's a, an effect where the scalar comes in gets absorbed by this operator on the black hole, uh, excites the operator, and then re-emits out to infinity, roughly speaking. There are also, in principle, scattering contributions where the incoming guy scatters off of the static gravitational field. But it turns out that in the limit that we look at, this coincidence limit in R goes to infinity, those scattering contributions can, don't contribute. So you don't have to keep them. You can just calculate this stuff. Um, so this calculation is uh, an in-in or schwinger keldish calculation because uh, we are looking at a fixed initial state. The black hole starts out in some state of corresponding to mass m. Uh, and then uh, rather than looking at a transition amplitude or a, you know, between in and out states, we're, we're looking at an expectation value. So the right formulation for such a problem is this close time path where you have to double the degrees of freedom to account for insertions or for the fact that you start out at some time, you evolve towards the future, and then, uh, and then at the end, you, you go back in time. So it's a bookkeeping trick to, uh, to uh, keep track of all the different time orderings. And so really, every diagram is actually a sum over several diagrams because you have to double the number of modes in your, in your theory. And uh, once you do that, you get an answer, for instance, for the, 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 the term that we really want in order to match looks something like that. And so, and, so, uh, and so everything is really a matrix because you have all the different time orderings contributing at some order. And so it involves both the all the possible propagators of the scalar um, propagating in flat space. So the, the, the Feynman, prop, the time ordered, the Whiteman propagator, the anti-time ordered, also known as the Dyson propagator. I guess not around, but um, Dyson introduced that. Uh, and so, uh, and then all, as well as all the different uh, two-point functions of this world line uh, mode. 
you do the calculation after all the dust settles. This is what you get in the effective theory. Leading order answer is the flat space part, just like in the full theory. And then uh, the, the non-trivial term, just like in the full theory, also is suppressed by 1 over r squared. And so now we can compare and extract the Green's functions. And they, so here's the full theory once again. And the answer depends on what state you're in, in the ballware state. Uh, it, again, it's a step function that encodes the fact that there's just absorption, no emission. In the UNRU state, you have both absorption and emission. And they're actually, as we anticipated in the, in the naive version of the calculation, they're actually emission and absorption come in roughly at the same order, even though one of them is an effect that they're classically absorption and emission is purely quantum. This whole thing was there to get to a plus of omega because you already got the other part. You know, you just yeah, yeah it's, just to get, it's just to get the negative frequency part and to see what happens when you include Hawking what radiation. If you just naively analyze the continuum, what you got from a, a minus state. Right. Does that make sense? Is that the you, you mean you just, you just uh, make it periodic in, in uh, yeah. 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 I think we tried that, but it's been a while. I have some notes where I tried doing that. I, I can't remember. Somehow it didn't work, but I but it but it's been a while, so I I, I can answer this later, but not in real time. Um, anyway, uh, the answers you get actually depend sensitively on which state you're in. Uh, the Bolware result I should have written it down here, but it goes like four pi r squared omega. It's actually suppressed relative to what you find even the absorptive part in the UNRU state. Um, that uh, suppression is, or rather the enhancement of the UNRU state, is just the fact that uh, you have this uh, Planck distribution here that you're expanding at low frequencies. Um, but it still leaves the question of why, why uh, this is somehow absorption modified once you uh, include Hawking radiation? Is the classical physics modified? So we'll still have to come back to that point. Um, anyway, uh, this is the answer, a leading order. And then uh, the simple check is that in the effective theory, we can calculate the flux due to the fact that this operator is spitting out modes. It's just related to the coincidence limit of this two-point function. It's just the expectation value of the, of the stress tensor or of the energy flux component. And sure enough, it agrees with uh, uh, once in terms of A plus, this is what it looks like. And then using our extraction of A plus, it agrees with the Hawking result in the, in the uh, low frequency or also high temperature limit where we're really looking at the, whatever it's called, the Raleigh genes law rather than the full Planck law. So, so, so that's a check. And then the other check is, um, and I'm starting to run out of time, but the other check is uh, that we get the same answers and more by looking at this other observable, which is the transition probabilities that I mentioned that Bekenstein conjectured and Wald uh, confirmed. Uh, so this is the probability that we start out with M modes all of the scalar all in the same identical wave packet in some fixed partial wave. The wave packet is uh, peaked around some frequency omega. Uh, the answer depends on also on the gray body factor. It's easier to write it down in terms of the reflection coefficient, one minus the gray body factor. And then it depends on the, on the Boltzmann factor for the, uh, at the Hawking temperature. And uh, this formula actually generalizes as well to rotating and charged black holes. All that changes is, well, the analytical, the form of the gray body factor is different. But the, the other thing that changes as well is that the Boltzmann factor becomes the one appropriate to, to whichever ensemble you're in. So that's the result. It also, as it should, obeys a detailed balance condition, which just reflects the fact that if you were to this is all in the UNRU state, by the way. The, the, this part of the calculation only allows us to probe the UNRU state. But the detailed balance just accounts for the fact that if you were to put the black hole in thermal 
in a thermal bath at the Hawking temperature, it needs to come to equilibrium. So that, that's what that uh, constraint encodes. That's the full theory and the effective theory. We just compute probabilities using time-dependent perturbation theory in some n particle state, which is in a wave packet. And then the probabilities are obtained after summing over all the states of the, of the black hole that are unobserved, all the final states. Uh, first, let me talk about um, vacuum to vacuum. That's, uh, that has a non-zero probability in the full theory. Uh, so we should compare that to what we get in the effective theory. And in the effective theory, what we get is actually infrared divergent, meaning that uh, because of translation invariance, it grows like some these integrals. If you don't cut them off, they diverge. So you have to cut them off at some time t. Uh, the way we interpreted this uh, infrared divergence is that it's just the decay rate of the black hole because it's emitting modes, so it's unstable. Uh, and we checked that by, I'm, I'm not going to show it, but we computed the second term in this expansion, the t squared, and found that it, all, that it, that it uh, is consistent with exponentiation as well. Uh, furthermore, if you look at the integrand in the rate, uh, and you plug in, um, well, the, the correlator that we found, uh, for instance, in the UNRWA state, it also agrees with the Hawking uh, calculation. So that seems to be a consistent interpretation. Um, the fact that there are infrared divergences, we make that to be due to the fact that our theory doesn't really capture the correct infrared physics because the black hole is evaporating or there's so, you know, eventually becomes a word of the Planck scale. We don't know what to do in the effective theory. So we don't expect the effective theory to really describe the deep infrared. By the way, neither do we expect the thing we're comparing to, to do that, because that's a calculation in a fixed background. Um, so we're stuck with this cutoff. But it turns out that you can compute quantities that are independent of the cutoff and match those. So the same infrared divergence shows up in the probability that you have the same number of particles in as out. And if you take the ratio, at least to leading order, the cutoff goes away. Uh, and the ratio is related to the same correlators. Uh, the same correlators are basically just the probability to either emit a single particle or absorb a single particle. Sorry, I'm pointing to the opposite things. Uh, so this is the prediction of the effective theory. And uh, the result due to Bekenstein uh, is this. And so it has the same dependence on n. I think that n dependence is just um, Physically, I believe it's just stimulated emission. If you have a lot of particles in the incoming state, you expect an enhancement. Uh, but furthermore, uh, it agree everything is consistent, the full theory and the effective theory, as long as the correlators agree with what we found by matching the two-point function. Uh, we can also, uh, using this result, uh, get all the other transition probabilities in the effective theory. They depend not they depend not on, on the endpoint functions, meaning uh, correlators with uh, a string of time-ordered uh, operators and a string of anti-time-ordered uh, operators. So these are the so-called, excuse me, schwinger keldish correlators. And uh, again, we compare the full and the effective theory. Here's the full theory. And uh, the combinatorics of the answer strongly suggests that the correlators, the multi-point correlators, are actually Gaussian in the schwinger keldish sense of Gaussian, meaning that, they're, uh, that they obey some sort of Wick's theorem where the uh, contractions in Wick's theorem is the matrix of uh, schwinger keldish two-point functions, so not just time-ordered not just the Feynman one, but also the Whiteman and the Dyson uh, functions. Uh, and so if we make that ansatz, the effective theory result looks like this, the same sort of combinatorics, uh, also related to the same single particle probabilities. And so that, uh, to us, is indication that these correlators are Gaussian in some sense. I don't think that should be surprising, because if we were to look at we're neglecting interactions of the scalar in the bulk. 
And if we look at the full theory, for instance, the Candelis uh, Green's functions, well, those will obey Wick's theorem if you're ignoring the interactions in the full theory. So it's got to be Gaussian. So that's what we find. And so now I think we know the effective theory in full. And so now let me interpret with the time. Uh, have, I'm running a little late, but I'll be done soon. Uh, so now let me uh, interpret the result. This is what we found for the scalar in the Unruh state. This is what we, at leading order. This is what we found in the Bolware state. Uh, Unruh is enhanced relative to Bolware. That's just the, the enhancement due to taking this low frequency limit of the Planck distribution. But what was surprising to us is that uh, even though this one includes emission, Hawking emission, which is supposed to be a, a purely quantum effect, there's no parametric suppression relative to what will be there classically. No powers of 1 over m Planck or anything of that sort. And so um, the resolution to that, we think, is that uh, anything classical will really be only sensitive by causality, but will only really be sensitive to the retarded two-point function. Certainly, when we were looking at these classical corrections to the equations of motion, they only depended on the retarded part of the correlator, the co which is proportional to the commutator. But in, in free field theory, uh, or in any sort of theory where the fields obey linear wave equations, uh, or the operators you're dealing with obey linear wave equations, uh, canonical quantization implies that the two-point function should just be uh, proportional to the identity. And therefore, when you take its expectation value in any state, you should get the same answer. So therefore, so here's the two-point function of the scalar computed in the effective theory. It depends on the commutator, namely the difference of the Whiteman functions. And it should be the same in the Unruh state and in the Bolware state. And here's the answer in the Bolware state. And so uh, somehow we're supposed to get the same thing in the Unruh state. And I'll check that in the next slide, that that's indeed the case. And then uh, this is the resolution to the puzzle because this statement will no longer be true once you start including self-interactions of the fields. So in particular, if we're looking at gravitons, the self-interactions are down by powers over M Planck. So at least for um, gravitational um, effects, uh, the difference between the state that doesn't Hawking emit and the difference between the state that does really is, as you would uh, intuitively expect, suppressed by powers of the Planck scale. And so all that remains to do is check that this uh, constraint really is satisfied. The difference is the same whether you're in the Bolware state or in the Unruh state. Uh, in the Bolware state at leading order, the difference of the correlators is just uh, related to the cross absorption cross-section. It's given by this quantity. Uh, in the Unruh state, we're finding that the Whiteman functions at positive and negative frequency are equal at leading order. So the answer is 0 up to a correction term that we actually have to compute. And so we did compute that in the paper. And I'm out of time anyway, so I can only very briefly tell you what goes into the calculation. There are two pieces. One of them is the correction to the fact that the incoming and outgoing scalars are interacting not just with this operator that dissipates. They're also scattering off of the geometry of the external field, gravitational field. And to leading order, that's just 1 over r. So this is basically just. Uh, ac accounting for the, it's just the Coulomb Green's function basically. It's just the 1 over r scattering and the 1 over r potential. There are also at this order corrections due to the four point function in inserted as a sort of self energy diagram. But from matching to the transition probabilities, we actually know what these are, so we were able to include them. Gaussian yeah, using the Gaussian. And so, uh, and so once you do that, you get that uh, the correction to the Unruh state response is this piece for um, emission, this, sorry, absorption, this piece for emission. And indeed, the difference agrees with what you get in the Bolware state. So that, for us, resolves the question of why, why are the Whiteman functions not Planck suppressed for the Hawking thing? Uh, yet, classically, you don't see any Hawking radiation, even, or at least it's 
suppressed by the Planck scale as it should be. And so uh, that's, uh, in a, um, way over time, uh, that's the setup of the theory. And now that we think we understand it, we can use it to do calculations. And so here's a process which one can compute. Now, now we're actually doing gravitons, and we're going to look at the scattering of some sort of scalar or matter field. We did scalar just uh, for simplicity, but it's the same thing for any other kind of field. Scattering off of the black hole. We're not looking at the case where the scalar is light, so it gets Hawking emitted. It's, it's going to be heavy compared to the, it's got, sorry, mass large compared to the temperature, mass small compared to the mass of the black hole. Also, we're again in this point particle limit, so all momentum transfers are small compared to the size of the black hole, inverse size of the black hole. And then uh, the matching calculation, uh, well, Bekenstein didn't give us a formula for gravitons, but I think it easily generalizes because it's just using the fact that it's a free field expanded in A's and A daggers uh, in some partial wave. So, uh, so we just basically change the gray body factor to the graviton one. That's the full theory. In the effective theory, you also do the matching in some fixed partial wave, and you have to put in uh, the Wigner D functions for the, for the polarizations and so on, more bells and whistles. But once you do that, you get an answer for the Whiteman functions in the Unruh state that looks like this at leading order. And then uh, this, the, uh, we don't have access to amplitudes in this theory because everything we do is inclusive. We're summing over final states. So here is uh, what, what we're computing. And then uh, for whatever it's worth, the answer is calculable. Uh, and so we, now we have all the pieces. And so the calculation itself is not so much the point. Rather, it's that it can be done. It's a definite prediction. And uh, if you compare it to things that have been computed already, you can compute loop corrections to the scattering of uh, a black hole of, of a, or a point mass of, of a scalar field, at leading order of the black hole and the point mass are the same. I'm not sure who first did these calculations. Maybe it was Donahue and collaborators. I'm not, I'm not 100%. But uh, if you compare uh, the powers of uh, G. Newton or M. Planck in this answer relative to the, canon so the usual loop calculations due to vacuum polarization, they're actually at the same order in powers of 1 over m Planck. It's slightly suppressed by more powers of the radius. That's because of the we're taking this point particle limit. That's where we know how to do things. But it is a, uh, I guess, a quantum gravity effect, uh, which is in some sense universal. It's there for black holes, uh, which had not been computed before. So for whatever. It's worth. That's a, the type of result that we can, we think we know how to compute in this theory. And I'm really way over time, so uh, I'll conclude now. So I um, set up a point particle description of black holes, to just to summarize, that includes Hawking radiation. Uh, what we found sort of surprising is that at the level of the correlators, there's no real hierarchy between what will be considered a classical absorption effect and a quantum or Hawking effect. However, as I uh, try to argue, uh, the effects of Hawking radiation drop out of classical things. So LIGO will not see this, or no foreseeable future of LIGO will see this, because it only couples to the retarded Green's function. And uh, classically, if you ignore Hawking radiation, or even if you put it in, it, it won't matter, uh, this thing can be used uh, for binary dynamics uh, in compact objects, not just black holes, but also uh, neutron stars. Uh, you can parameterize things in terms of the absorption in neutron stars. Uh, and quantum mechanically, it also has uh, applications and quotes to various uh, black hole processes that have been computed uh, in the past. So I uh, will end there. Thank you.